Good morning. Good morning. And welcome home worshipers to this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Let us give praise to our Creator because God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and love. We humbly ask that you forgive us for what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct us, Father God, as to what you have called us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today's scripture comes from the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning with verse 30 and going into chapter 5, ending with verse 1. Please listen as I read from St. Paul's epistle. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore be imitators, imitators I say, of God as beloved children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Little League Baseball coach motioned for one of his players to come to him. When the player arrived, the coach said he would like to share with him some of the principles of sportsmanship. He said, as your coach, I don't believe in temper tantrums or screaming at the umpires or using any bad language. Looking straight at this little boy, the coach asked, do you understand what I'm telling you? The young boy nodded his head, yes. All right then, the coach said, do you think you can explain it to your father? In our Ephesian scripture this Sunday morning, St. Paul says, and do not grieve, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, together with all malice. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? St. Paul is saying, don't make the Holy Spirit grieve. Don't upset ever the Holy Spirit with any of your words or actions. St. Paul is saying, don't make the Holy Spirit unhappy, if you will. The Holy Spirit is that part of the Trinity that dwells within us. It is in our heart. It's the voice of God speaking to us about our relationship with Him and our relationship with all those around us. We grieve the Holy Spirit, folks, when we live in a way that isn't in accord with the kind of person God has called each and every one of us to be. We can grieve the Holy Spirit with our words and with our deeds, if you will, our actions. It's challenging when we become a new person in Christ, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, particularly when we read the details of the new life that Paul describes about never being angry or deceitful or having malice in our hearts or never letting any corrupt words come from our lips. Not even a little league umpire makes a bad call should anything come from our lips. But St. Paul, in his last two verses of the fourth chapter, indirectly gives us a little formula, a little formula that should help us. The first part of the formula is this, look inward. That is, take care of what's inside of you. Consider those words again. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away, put away from us. Do you have any of those emotions like bitterness and anger within your heart? Have you ever had? Let's face it, there are many otherwise committed Christians, even young ones I'm thinking, who have a great deal of anger within them on occasion. They are committed Christians who are bitter. There are committed Christians with malice in their hearts. Paul asks us to look within at any of those negative emotions that may be there. Paul Harvey, the late great radio personality, once told about a medical student who was doing a rotation in toxicology at a poison control center. A very angry, angry and upset woman called because she caught her four-year-old daughter eating ants. The medical student reassured her that ants were not very harmful. Furthermore, there would be no need to even take her to the emergency room that she would survive this. The caller calmed down and at the end of the phone call, she said, 
Well, I did give her a little bit of ant poison to kill those ants. The medical student told this mother that she'd better take her daughter ASAP to the emergency room. You know, anger is a bit like ant poison. It needs to be dealt with immediately, or it can cause serious damage to one's soul. There are times in our lives when we have anger, oftentimes a great deal of anger within us, inside. And interestingly, and interestingly enough, this anger doesn't always show. Psychiatrists say that depression is anger turned inward. Not all depression, of course. Some depression may be, may be explained by chemical imbalance, but for some depression comes from anger, anger that is yet to be expressed. There are some people who, when they get angry, explode. I've known a few of these. Then it's over in a short amount of time. But there are other people who turn this anger inside. They may not be aware that they're really that angry. They have suppressed it for so long, and that's the reason. But they don't know why they're mournful and maybe weep on occasion. They go to a counselor who asks, hmm, with whom are you angry? St. Paul tells us to look inward, to examine the inner emotions that are a part of each and every human being. For you see, our inner condition oftentimes determines the way we respond to others around us. It's not always what comes to us from the outside that determines our behavior. It's what's already on the inside. Therefore, take care of what's inside, inside you. So, if we are to live the new life, we are first of all to look within, but we can't stop there. We are to begin with an inward look, but this is only the beginning. But then St. Paul advises for us to look outward. That is, take care of our relationships. Be kind and compassionate to one another, he writes, forgiving each other just as Christ Jesus has forgiven us. You see, faith never stops with an inward look. Faith is always to look outward. Now, Christian faith doesn't consist of only kindness. Kindness is a byproduct, I think, of faith in Christ. I think it's a misconception when people think Christian faith is simply people being kind to one another. Christian faith has to do with much, much more than that. The minimal requirement of Christian faith is that we treat others kindly and with respect. Such kindness, I find, is contagious. There's a story from the life of African missionary Albert Schweitzer. A number of years ago on his way to Aspen, Colorado, Schweitzer changed trains in Chicago. As he was standing on the platform, he was being questioned by reporters. A woman struggling to carry a very large suitcase was coming by. Immediately, Dr. Schweitzer excused himself from the reporters. He walked over to the lady, took the heavy suitcase, and carried it with her following to where she was going. He then turned and walked back to the cluster of reporters who had been there. They were gone. They just left. Seeing Albert Schweitzer's helpfulness, they started looking for people to help as well. There was a reason Albert Schweitzer helped that lady. He told about it in his autobiography. He said that he and his wife were boarding a train one day when they were in Africa. They had an enormous amount of luggage with them, and they too, both of them, were struggling with all of it. A physically disabled man, whom Schweitzer had treated in his mission hospital, came forward to help him. He had no luggage, said Schweitzer, because this man had nothing. Schweitzer was greatly moved by the man's offer, which he accepted. While they walked along side by side, Schweitzer vowed that in memory of this man's kindness, he would always keep a lookout at stations for someone he might be able to help in the future. And this vow, said Schweitzer, he had kept forever. However, sometimes if we are trying to be helpful, trying to be kind, we can be suspected of having maybe ulterior motives. But we must make the effort if we're going to live the Christian life we have been called to do. We are not only to be concerned with our inner righteousness, but we must also be concerned with our outer witness. I need to say that again. We are not only to be concerned with our inner righteousness, but we must also be concerned with our outer witness. So today we are challenged to not only look inward, but we are also challenged to look outward. But I'll say it once again, we're not to stop there. We are also reminded to look upward. 
Notice what St. Paul says, forgiving each other just as Christ Jesus forgave us. This is why we are to forgive others, because we have been forgiven. He continues, he says, be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love. This is the answer to malice, bitterness, and anger, I think. There is the answer for making us kind and forgiving toward one another. We are to imitate God. We are to be imitators of God. We are to acknowledge and to remind ourselves of the great love and kindness and mercy and forgiveness we have received from God over and over again. Charles Shedd once applied this to anger. He wrote, it's no sin in having a temper. It's only a sin to go on having it. And if that is the case, then pray. For prayer has helped many to bring a bad temper under control. The best way to lose your temper, writes Pastor John Shred, is to lose yourself in God. Not only are we to look inward and to look outward, but also to look upward, upward to God, our Redeemer. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that it's easy, but it is possible. Perhaps you've seen the 1995 movie, Dead Man Walking. It was based on a book, a true story book, about Sister Helen Pregene, played by Susan Sarandon in the movie. She established a very special relationship with Patrick Saunter, a prisoner on death row. In the book, Sister Pregene tells about Lloyd LeBlanc, whose son had been killed by Saunter. Saunter was executed for his crime. Afterwards, LeBlanc told Sister Pregene that he would have been content with just imprisonment for life for that man. He didn't want him put to death. He said that he attended Saunders' execution, not seeking revenge, but hoping that there might be an apology. Before sitting in the electric chair, Saunders said, Mr. LeBlanc, I want to ask your forgiveness for what I did. LeBlanc nodded his head to signal that forgiveness had been given. LeBlanc said that when he arrived at the sugarcane field, to find his dead son and identify him, he knelt and he said the Lord's Prayer. When the prayer was over, he said, whoever did this, I forgive them. LeBlanc told Sister Virginia that it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing for him to do, to overcome his feelings of anger that welled up within him from time to time. He said, especially on the birthday of my dead son. Forgiveness is never going to be easy, she told him. Each day it must be prayed for. Folks, I don't know any other way for us to forgive and accept others who have done us wrong than to remember that God has forgiven us over and over and over again. The ultimate help for us in meeting this challenge each day is not only to look inward, look inward, or look outward at others, but also to look upward to God. We are to live a new life, a Christian life, and we must be aware of the emotions within us and we need to keep them under control more importantly we must become imitators of god amen